So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you recall, two weeks ago, the 15th Sunday of ordinary time, Jesus was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. He was so astonished and disappointed at the people's lack of faith that he was unable to perform any mighty deeds there. Then last Sunday, Jesus went to other towns and villages and sent out the twelve, the twelve apostles, two by two, to preach, to cast out demons, and to heal the sick in his name. In today's gospel, the twelve return and share with their master about their successful deeds and all things they have done in the name of, the, of Jesus. They also felt tired, burdened, and frightened, and the Lord asked them to go to the des deserted place to rest, to take some time off from work, to give thanks to God, to bond, and to strengthen the relationship among themselves. In preparing for this homily, the key word that makes me ponder the most in today's readings is the shepherd. We know from our experience and the scriptures, there are good shepherds and bad shepherds, true shepherds and false shepherds, temporal shepherd and eternal shepherd. So the obvious question is, what is the shepherd? According to Marion Webster Dictionary, shepherd is a person who takes care of or guards a flock of sheep. The Holy Bible defines the shepherd as someone who watches over, looks after, or guides somebody. The law is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Come from the most beloved all passages of the scriptures, Psalm 23, which is, we just heard from the responsorial, responsorial psalm today. In this passage and throughout the New Testament, we learn that the law is our shepherd in two ways. First, as a good shepherd, he lays down his life for his sheep. And second, his sheep know his voice and follow him. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, and his sheep know his voice and follow him. The language that our Holy Father Francis, Pope Francis, uses as the Good Shepherd smells his sheep. The psalmist tells us that the shepherd meets the sheep's every need, food, water, safety, and direction. When we, are, we as believers follow our shepherd, we too know that we will have all we need. We will not lack of necessaries of life, for he knows exactly what we need. The shepherd cares for the sheep because he loves them and is faithful to them. The Pope, Bishop, and Priest are often referring as shepherd to tend the flocks entrusted to their care. God chooses certain people to be leaders and shepherds of souls. Even though they are not perfect or even near perfect, 
We are like everyone else, sinners. However, to the mercy, compassion, and the grace of God, we are doing God's work in serving others. Through their works, God perfects them and the people He entrusted to their care. I am too among the broken ones. With the grace of God, He shows His mercy, protection, guidance, and love to all. By the virtues of baptism, we are separate to each other. Parents shepherd for their children. Teachers shepherd for their students. Workers shepherd for their co-workers. Friends shepherd for their friends. Classmates shepherd for their classmates, and so on. We need to ask ourselves two important questions. First, what type of shepherd am I? And second, what makes me a good shepherd? The good shepherd knows the need of his sheep. He feels them and smells them. He knows each of them by name and what they need. He, gather, he gathers the sheep and unites them into one flock. On the other hand, the bad shepherd abandons the flock. He allows the flock to be destroyed and scattered, to do whatever they want. He doesn't care for the sheep. He does not take any responsibility for their lives even. There are five qualities of good shepherd that I can think of. The good shepherd, the first thing, he is a good person. He protects, he guides, he nurtures, and he lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus, our good and true shepherd, nourishes and strengthens us, guiding us on the right path. Jesus brings peace and unity among Jew and Gentiles, between believers and unbelievers, between men and women, and between God and humanity. Jesus is a real shepherd sent by God to care for God's people and lead them to God. Jesus is a good shepherd who lays down his life for you and for me so that we may have eternal life with him. May the Lord grant us a caring and loving heart to treat and care for others who are within us and outside of us with dignity, loving care, and compassion. Amen. Well, if we remember last week, Jesus sent off the disciples to go out on mission. Well, today's gospel is the disciples just returned from doing their first mission trip. They were excited about all they had accomplished. But Jesus said to them, come away by ourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Jesus wanted the 12 apostles to have an experience of a spiritual rest so they could better understand how their efforts participated in God's divine will for the world, a spiritual rest. Our Bishop Mungenberg tells us, Spiritual rest is meant to foster and deepen our intimate relationship with the Lord so that our efforts of ministries are not just working for God, but a participation in God's work. There is a big difference between these two approaches to ministry. 
It is the experience of, of a regular spiritual test, rest, sitting with God, appreciative relationship with God that allows us to know the mind and heart of Jesus and to do God's will with an eagerness, generosity, and freedom. One dimension of discipleship is not possible without the other. If we only work tirelessly to serve the needs of others, then we run the risk of becoming detached from the life-giving relationship with Jesus that is the foundation of our identity as disciples. Myself and the volunteering work that I do, I've come across people which I call hardened hearts, where the system, the system they're working in within the service has beaten them down and their hearts to the point where they almost get angry at God. On the other hand, if we only seek to be withdrawn and contemplative rest with Jesus, then we can fail, then we can fail to accomplish the ministry that Jesus has entrusted to us, like the disciples, the apostles, which the world so desperately needs and we're called to do. It is important for the discipleship, the disciples, us to balance these two important dimensions of faith, the lives so that they can effectively respond instruments of God. But I think it's more than that. It's more than balancing between the works of faith, but it's the integration of working our faith with the works we do. It's called loving God and loving neighbor. I think it's a rhythm of our Christian life. The Christian life is a continuously going into the presence of God from the presence of interacting with people and coming out of into the presence of people from the presence of God. They go together. It is like the rhythm that we have when we sleep and work. Sleep becomes those times of prayer, quiet, quiet listening, adoration time, and work being times of relationships, service, caring for one another. We cannot work unless we have our time of rest. And sleep will not come unless we have worked until we are tired. Christian life is the alternate meeting with God in our secret places, that prayer, and serving people in the marketplace. How can we do God's work unless in God's strength? How can we receive that strength unless we seek that quietness, that listening, that presence of God? Today's gospel, after resting, a very little bit they got, but they did get some rest on that boat. Jesus' heart was moved with pity for the marketplace, the mass crowd around him. Pity is the word that was used. The word translates from Greek. It means that Jesus' gut was wrenched as he saw them. He was really touched. It's like parents who see their children and they get hurt and they're in pain. It is compassion, merciful love. And where there's compassion, that bridge, is when we go from sympathy to action, our work. Myself as a deacon, much of my ministry falls around serving the people in the marketplace. Going to the marketplace is sometimes not easy. There's suffering involved with people, there's poverty, there's anger, there's sadness, there's loneliness. You get to deal with people who have no places to live, families who are trying to keep their house or accommodate a suffering illness. Even myself get to go visit pastors in different parishes that are suffering and struggling with with facility issues. It all kind of sounds to me like awful, doesn't it? Depressing, maybe overwhelming. But there is a rhythm here, our Christian rhythm as disciples of Jesus. St. Mother Teresa, God bless her, is my example. I call on her that simple statement over and over again. In the poor, we meet Jesus. But she also says, we are all poor in some way. And we do meet him. I do meet him. We experience the presence of God deep, deep within our, ourselves, within that service we're doing, regardless of the situation I'm in. But I've also have learned that I must have my personal time with Jesus. And without it, 
or when it becomes less of a priority, then that hardened heart starts to happen to me in the marketplace. I, play, I become less compassionate, less understanding, and a question, why am I doing this? What is this all about? The work and thoughts come, now become more about me than about the other. I need my daily time quiet, prayer time, listening to God, short stops in adoration. These are times to build me up, to become close to God. Sometimes I just need to get away. My wife tells me that once in a while. A retreat to have some time with God, to have that closeness with Him. In that closeness with Him, in that time that I'm with Him and loving Him, He loves me. That flame to desire to serve grows, to serve others becomes alive. A loving heart and not a hardened heart. We should try every effort to find a place to rest and to reflect so that we can be sure to remember who vested us, Jesus, and the power of God, and that power in the first place and whose mission we are carrying out. We should try every effort so that when we do go out to meet the crowds, we can meet them with that same compassion that Jesus does and did. This last year, this last year with the COVID, the pandemic, my life, and I think many of us, have had to do a lot more time without being in that marketplace. We just couldn't get around, we weren't wanted, we just perish, and activities here for me came to a halt. I found myself, my prayer life, my actions, the relationships were all centered at home or around me. I spent a lot of time with myself. The interaction wasn't there. It can be a comfortable situation to be in, a comfortable mindset to get into. Loving God within myself, my friends and my little family, that's all, and nobody else. But we are all called to love our neighbor. And in loving our neighbor, discipleship becomes alive. Our St. James, in the epistle, he nails it. He nails it big time. He says, What good is it to profess faith without practicing it? Such faith has no power to save one, has it? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and no food or food for the day, and you say to them, goodbye, good luck, keep warm, well fed, but do not meet their bodily needs, what good is that? So it is with the faith that does nothing in practice. I'm going to quote Pope Francis in a recent homily he did. He says, let us remember, please, that for disciples of Jesus, to love is to serve, and to serve is the reign. Power lies in service, not in anything else. The church has a heart inflamed by love. Yes, a humble heart throbbing with service. Next week's gospel, we will see how Jesus, in his merciful compassion, has a throbbing heart for love in the marketplace. Can you hear Jesus calling you? Loving God and loving neighbor. Loving God with a humble heart, throbbing with service.